this video, I'll be discussing the six steps necessary to properly warp an audio sample in Ableton Live. These six steps are, one, make sure the sample is not already warped, two, crop the sample to just the portion that you want to use, three, determine the pulse or the meter of the sample, four, align the sample to the grid with an Ableton Live, five, warp the sample, and six, make any necessary adjustments or turn on looping. first record an audio sample or import an audio sample into Ableton Live, Ableton has most likely warped the sample, trying to align its rhythmic information to whatever the current project's tempo is and meter. And in most cases this is wrong unless we've already gone through and warped this audio sample and properly aligned it to the grid, at which point Ableton will remember that and allow us to just drag and drop it in future instances. So to talk a little bit more in depth about this, let's go check out our preferences with Ableton Live. The Record, Warp, and Launch tab. And then the second section down here, we can see our preferences for how Ableton behaves when I import an audio sample. I prefer to leave my short sample, so how Ableton behaves when I import a short sample, which is generally a few seconds long, to unwarped one shot, so that Ableton won't warp anything that I drag into Ableton. And then the same for the long samples, I like to leave warping turned off. So this way anything I import into Ableton Live is not going to be warped and it's going to wait for me to specify that warping or enable warping for those samples and align it to the grid that I align it to the grid in the way that I see fit. For recording though, these preferences aren't um, customizable as of yet with the current version of Ableton Live. And that means that anytime I record anything into my project, Ableton's automatically going to enable warping on that audio file. So before we begin to warp any audio file to align it to the grid, first thing I want to do is make sure that warping is turned off by double-clicking on the sample I'm going to be working with, coming down to its sample editor view here, and clicking on the warp icon there to disable that warping button. We can tell the difference visually between a warped and an unwarped sample by looking in the editor here, and we can first off see that there's a bars, beats, and divisions of beat ruler here, which if I disable warping, isn't present, as well as we can see all these little tick marks here where Ableton has detected transients. So again, the first step of warping here is to disable warping. Now we'll be able to specify how we want this to align to the grid rather than the way that Ableton has thought it should align to the grid. Next, I want to crop the sample down to just the portion that I want to use. And I can do this one of two ways. I can do it by editing the waveform here in the arrangement view, or I can do it by adjusting the start and end markers within the sample editor down here by clicking and dragging on these arrows here. So the first mode is up here in the arrangement view, which is kind of the quick and dirty way of doing things. So that I can zoom in and then just simply click and drag over the waveform and select just the chunk that I want to use and then press Command E or Control click on the title bar here. Go down to Split, which will isolate out. It'll separate this chunk out from the rest of the track. Then I can simply delete that portion of it. And you can see here down in the sample editor that it's actually adjusted those start and end markers to exactly that selection. So that might be a good way of working with a larger sample, but I always prefer to come in and do this on the detail level, detail-oriented level by clicking and dragging on these to get them as close as I can both to the point at which I want to separate the track, but also trying to find a zero crossing to avoid any clips or pops that might happen from instantaneous jumps uh, from, uh, from amplitude levels within this waveform. So I'm trying to find zero crossings there. I'm going to do the same thing to the start of the sample as well. See, this is just a little bit off, so let's bring this up to just the start of that. And now I've got my sample cropped down to the portion that I want to use. If I intend to turn this sample into a loop later on, I might want to check and make sure that my cropping is conducive to being translated into a loop to make sure that both the endpoints aren't capturing any of the next bar or that kick drum that we know follows this, and also that my pulse is consistent, so I'm capturing the entire last pulse there of the pattern before it loops back around. So to check this, I can simply click on the title bar of this clip here, then press Command L on my computer's keyboard, which is going to turn on and adjust the arrangement loop bracket here to match exactly the length of the clip 
that I've created from this cropping of it. And now when I play this back, it will loop that portion of it. And we can listen to what it sounds like as it goes from the beginning or the end of the sample background to the beginning. Cool, so that's nice and smooth, but what if I accidentally got a little bit of this kick drum in there? So I'm going to drag this out, click on the title bar again, and press Command L. It's going to adjust that loop bracket out just a little bit to include my new cropping of this clip. It sounds like this. So there we can hear that that kick drum ever so slightly jumps in right there at the end, which visually we couldn't see with it all zoomed out like that, but orally we can really hear that coming in there. So I'd know that I needed to adjust this back in and then adjust my loop bracket there and I could test it out and hear that that's nice and smooth. Conversely, I might have the opposite issue where I've accidentally chopped out a little bit of this last synth note here. So if we listen to this, paying attention to the pulse. Pa, 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 pa. We can hear that there's a little bit of a skip there that's resulting from not having that entire last synth pulse there. So I know that I need to stretch this back out a little bit. Check that again and get it to the point that it sounds smooth every time it wraps around from the end of the loop back to the beginning of the loop. So that's just one kind of fine detail that you might want to consider as you're cropping this sample. Next, we'll need to determine the pulse and the meter of the sample so that we can properly set up our grid within Ableton and then align our sample to that grid. We'll start by determining the pulse. And the pulse is just the general rhythm um, or organization of the rhythms for the sample itself. And it's what you would tap your foot along to or snap along to. Um, and it can be a variety of things and it's kind of up to you to choose which one it is. So within this sample, let's listen to the possible pulses that could be this sample's pulse. So the first most obvious one is actually visually represented here in this waveform where we can see the loud and then quiet, loud and getting quiet, loud and getting quiet. And we can hear that as the synth chords are repeated over and over again. And it goes along with this. We could also say that it's half this rate so that our pulse is every other pulsation or every other repetition of this synth line. We could even say it's half of that value, so it's every four. Or half of that, or so on and so forth. Um, or we might later decide that, in fact, we have um, two pulses for every one of these pulses with our synth line here, or repetitions of our synth note. And maybe that's our pulse. Um, my decision is going to be based upon um, or reinformed by the meter here. So I'm going to start to listen to other aspects of this sample to determine how these uh, pulses might be grouped into bars. So if we listen to this, I hear one chord repeating, new chord repeating and a third chord repeating. So those are going to be kind of instances where I can determine that there is some sort of significant event happening here that might help me retroactively organize the pulses that preceded that. So if we listen to this first chord here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. So we could say that there are eight pulses per measure if we're assigning each one of these repetitions of the chord to be uh, our pulse value. So we'd come up here and say 8 as our number, and then we just simply decide 8 of what. So 8 quarter notes, 8 eighth notes, uh, 8 sixteenth notes, whatever we want our division of it to be. Um, let's go back to quarter notes. And then let's decide whether or not we think that um, the pulse is exactly what the synth is playing here, or if it's half that value, or half of half, or so and so forth. So here it is again. 
So let's try counting four rather than eight against that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two. So I think four sounds good to me. So we're going to go with four quarter notes so that we've got eight eighth notes or four quarter notes of the bar. And our pulse is one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Boom. So now that we know we've got it at that pulse in four, four, and we've actually also determined that there's three measures here to this loop. So all that information we're going to be using to determine how this aligns to the grid. Now that we've gotten to know the pulse and the meter of our sample, we can align it to the grid. I do this by making sure that the actual clip here is aligned with the very beginning of any measure. It doesn't necessarily have to be the first measure of the piece, but any measure. That way when I turn on my metronome, the sound that it's clicking out to me aligns with um, the sample's position in relationship to the start of a bar. So if I turn on the metronome by clicking here, and I can adjust its volume by adjusting the blue slider here on the master track, I can play it back and listen to how the current tempo of my project aligns with the pulse and the meter of the sample I'm working with. So it's kind of funky the way that they align currently, but it's not correct. So making sure that warping is still turned off, I'm going to start to adjust the project's tempo until I hear a closer relationship between uh, the pulsation and the meter of the sample and the tempo and the meter of our project. I can also use my eyes to visually enforce what I'm hearing by noticing that I can see these pulsations in the waveform itself. And then if we listen here, let's listen without the metronome on, I can identify which of these um, pulses within the waveform is that chord change, which we already know is the downbeat of the next bar. Cool, so we can see that one right there is the downbeat of the next bar. So I can actually just come up here and start decreasing the tempo until I see this waveform here slide over and align with the downbeat of bar two. So I'm going to start to decrease the tempo and we can see that sliding across. And there it's a little bit closer and let's zoom in here and see how we're doing. It's a little bit soon there so let's bump it up. A little bit too far so if I hold the command down on my computer's keyboard and click and drag I can move in smaller increments until it's as close as I can get it there. I can also see that these other waveforms, which I currently have my grid set to eighth notes by just control clicking on the grid there. I can change the division of my grid. So let's go eighth notes. And I can see that they're all slightly behind. So there is some fluctuation to uh, the performance that this synth player had. But I'm just looking to see as, to get it as close as I can. So I can see there bar threes a little bit ahead. So let's adjust this out until it's right on. And so that's looking pretty good to me. Now let's turn our metronome back on and listen to this. Oops, let's start from the beginning. Nice, that's really close. So now that I've got it aligned to that grid a lot closer, again, it's not totally perfect, but it's a lot closer certainly than we, when we started. Now is the time when I can go down and enable warping. With our sample now closely aligned to the grid, we can enable warping on this sample, which will actually break this sample into discrete portions rather than it being a total sample that has a start and an endpoint. It will be broken down into smaller chunks based upon the warping algorithms that we use and the warp markers that we place within this. So to enable warping, we just come back to the sample editor box here and click on the warp. Um, Ableton's going to ask us if we want to keep this current clip timing, which means that when we first recorded or imported this sample into Ableton, it aligned to the grid in a different way, and Ableton warped the sample in a different way to the grid um, than it is currently aligned to the grid. And since we just went through this whole process of realigning this sample to the grid, we actually want to keep this clip's current timing. So I'm going to say yes. And now we'll see that Ableton's actually gone through and warped this sample. We know that because the bars, beats, and divisions of beats rulers back as well as these little ticks, which we can actually see are at each of those pulsations that we'd already identified in this sample. So our sample is now stuck to the grid, which means that as I play this sample back, as I adjust the tempo, we 
can hear that that sample stays stuck to that grid and plays back at whatever tempo we've got set within our project. The final step of warping an audio sample is to adjust any minute timing issues that might occur within the performance of the sample, as well as to enable looping if we want to be able to loop this sample in the session view. So to adjust timing, we use warp markers within the sample. And we can create or delete warp markers by simply double-clicking in this dark gray portion above the waveform viewer here. So if I double-click, I'll create a warp marker. And warp markers allow me to shift the location of an event within the audio file in a correspondence to the grid. So as you can see here, I can click and move this audio event back or forward within the grid. You'll notice though that as I work with warp markers, it's stretching everything to one side and compressing or shifting back everything to the other side. So I found that it's best to work with these warp markers in groupings of three. I'm going to command Z here to get back to the original. So if I work with them in groups of three, so I've got one placed here at the beginning by default and one placed here at the start of bar three. Let's create another one by double clicking at beat three of bar one. And I can shift this around. You can see that the exteriors or these outer two warp markers keep the locations of that sample or that location of the sample where it should be. And then I'm just adjusting just these events within here. So I'm going to use these to go through this and check and make sure. So like example here, I can see that bar three is a little bit off. So I'm going to shift that over to bar three. And I'm going to come and check the end of the loop here. And I can see that it's a little bit off. So let's come in and create a warp marker here. Drag this over to the downbeat of bar four. And I can also see that my end is a little bit off. So let's bring that in to exactly bar four. And let's go check and make sure everything else is looking good. Bar two is on. And it looks like there's a little bit of timing issue here. So let's shift that over. A little bit of one here. So shift this over. Bar one looks good. Bar two just a little bit off. There we go. Now let's listen to that. Oops. That's right. Let's get back to our original tempo of 80. Yeah. Great. So now we fixed any tiny little uh, timing errors that we might have. And the only other thing I want to do now is turn this into a loop so that if I were to use this in my session view, it continue to loop whenever I trigger it to play back. So to do this, I can either click and drag over the portion of the sample that I want to loop and select those first three bars and then press Command L on my computer's keyboard, which you can see has adjusted my clip view loop brackets here to exactly those first three bars. Or I can just click and drag them to adjust them as I see fit. Um, the one thing you do want to be sure of is that when working with beat-oriented music, so non-ambient stuff, that the length of your loop is exactly a bar length. So in this case, you'd want to see any number here at the first box followed by two zeros, indicating that this loop is exactly three bars long or exactly two bars long or exactly one bar long. So that way, as it continues to loop, it's not going to slowly phase out of alignment with our grid. So that's just one thing you want to check for to make sure that that's lined up. So now all we have to do is copy this, paste it into our session view, and when I trigger that, turn off the metronome, we've got a ready to use sample for our future projects.